<laughs> Chris, are you good? Shall we start? Okay, right. perfect. Welcome, guys, uh, to our presentation regarding MOPs, our motion operators for Houdini Toolkit. That is Henry, I am Mo. Those are some nice quotes by Henry, fresh from this morning when we tried fixing the, la the latest bug. Yeah, we just pushed a new build actually this morning after I realized we had a bug in our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we roll. J short uh, disclaimer before we start, everything we are saying, or at least I am saying, is based on bad assumptions, so it might not be true. Do not draw any conclusions out of what I say. Do draw conclusions of uh, out of what he says. And of course, I don't know if you, some of you, some of you guys know us, I think. And we had a reputation to undermine. So the question was, which type of prison wine would you fancy for this presentation? Because I quote unquote brewed champagne the last time I presented. So I, I supposed apple cider or pineapple wine or maybe banana. And of course, Henry answered just by Welsh grape juice and fermented, which I don't know what Welsh grape juice is, but I knew Capri Sun pretty well. So I bought that. And uh, the I problem. Thought, I thought you were joking. No, the problem is when you're fermenting or when you're trying to make quote unquote wine out of Capri Sun, this is an issue because Capri Sun actually got into shit in Germany because they were such a high sugar content. Turns out if you're low on sugar, which they advertise, you only get like 4% of wine. So of course you end up adding a half a kilo of sugar for four, <laughs> for four liters of Capri Sun, <laughs> then slamming it in some sanitized bottle, whatever, slamming on a valve. And you end up with what we call the Capri Sun. <laughs> <laughs> which I invite you to taste, so if anyone wants to taste this while we're presenting, just make your way out over here, grab one of those nice glasses and have a sip of that. Um, I haven't tried this yet, so I got I'm really curious. I, I, I accidentally got some of those into my mouth and siphoning it off from the bottle and it was not pleasant. <laughs> um, also, this is well chilled now, if, so if you wait until it's reached ro room temperature, you will um, you experience get its full flavor. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I'll just go go light on us and just start off with a small portion here. Is it gonna make us or um, I hope not. It's just it's just really bad wine. That's how my <laughs> wife described it. I'm I'm tasting all kinds of shit. But so here's to you guys and uh, here's to mops. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> That's rancid. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. It's an, it's an Ill insult to your taste bud, so please have some of that while we're presenting. So with that, I still don't know how to pronounce that, but hello. Um, whatever. <laughs> the, the, this is the Siegfried and Roy, the, the Sonny and Cher of Mops, of Houdini, and the Han and Shui of Motion Graphics. And it was about one year ago that we actually um, released and presented Mops, the Motion Operators Toolkit for Houdini, actually at EUE. So uh, now we want to take our time and have a look at the first decade of MOPS. <laughs> and um, just to give you guys a general overview of what we're trying to achieve, it's these types of effects. So basically just having a bunch of instances, a bunch of copies um, driven by some sort of value, either a shader or a noise or whatever. Those bread and butter motion graphics effects. And before we dive in the technical why we wanted to do MOPS or why we saw necessity for MOPS, you like it? <laughs> um, let's dive a bit into the social aspects or um, the observations that led us to the idea that a motion operator's toolkit might be a good idea. Again, some of that stuff is just personal um, experience, which ni might not hold true for every place and every time. Um, so be careful with that. Um, at least until yesterday evening when I discussed with some of you and uh, li listened to some of your stories from VFX, I was pretty sure that VFX was actually pretty civil in comparison to motion graphics, to advertising, to motion design for advertising clients. Because in, in, in VFX you usually have bigger teams, that means you have at least dedicated people who can support a pipeline, who can write tools, who can support artists. Um, not so in motion design, where basically speed is the champion. It's just like, in motion design you have just smaller budgets, you have smaller teams, you have less time. and um, in my opinion, one of the major reasons for why we're seeing Houdini simmer into motion design more and more recently lies in the availability of single man, single artist, or small shop-centered tools. Tools such as Redshift or um, even Octane who make it possible to render um, photorealistic frames on a single workstation without a big render farm. Um, hardware like uh, multi-core processors like the Threadrippers from AMD or even the Core i9s from Intel. And the availability of cheap um, big RAM sticks. Simulation still needs big RAM. 
um, but also due to client demand for more FX-centered, more photoreal workflow in an advertising workflow. So instead of where we traditionally came from, from After Effects, um, occasionally adding bits and pieces of 3D here and there, it's all mainly full 3D now, and probably photoreal with effects. So here are some observations that I made when working in motion design or animation for advertising and in the production phase. So um, this is purely geared to um, after your past conception, after you had your idea developed and you're now trying to actually build this into an animated sequence. And I'm speaking here for motion design, but I have the gut feeling that some of this might hold true also for games, for um, Arcvis or for VFX. And again, please take this with a grain of salt, just my personal experience. So working in production in advertising usually means quick turnaround times. And by quick turnaround times, I mean anything from three days for a short Instagram spot with just the product turning to the actual, ever, the longest project I've ever worked on were like nine months, which, which was a Nike job and which was just like, it was a long project. Um, and with those smaller uh, with those smaller projects and smaller project times, there come smaller budgets, of course. And with smaller budgets and little time, unnecessary overhead is going to kill you. It's going to kill your team's efficiency. And with your team's efficiency, it's going to kill the whole team's mood. Um, it's going to kill your margin. And finally, if you're not really careful, it's going to kill your relationship. I've seen that in colleagues. Um, so what you want to uh, avoid is wasting everyone's time. And instead of making a list of how to avoid wasting everyone's time, I found the contrary easier and making a list with how to efficiently waste everyone's time. And in motion graphics and advertising production, I found these ways to really just boil everyone's time. And it's compartmentalization. One thing that might really work for a big workshop, for a big pipeline, is killer when you are trying to implement this in a small shop in a tight, um, tight environment. Um, it absolutely makes sense to have specialists. It doesn't make sense to have them compartmentalized because that creates unnecessary communication overhead between individual departments. And also creating individual departments kind of hedges a certain um, social communication level within a department that might not be compatible with other ones. So you're just setting them up for fighting if not done properly. And we discussed this uh, this morning when we were just going through the slides because you were claiming that you some somewhat have a different experience with that. Well, there are motion design shops, smaller ones, that do invest in pipelines, but they're rare. And if they do have a pipeline, it's possible to have a more specialized team because you can pass data back and forth between departments without needing extra communication or without there being any confusion. But most design shops, speaking from experience, have no interest in investing in pipelines, yeah. so they just won't. Yeah, it's rarely done, so um, yeah. Um, Another thing to kill everyone's time is hiring a big team. Again, if you're working on a small project, tight deadline, hiring a big team has so much overhead. It comes with so much overhead to just get everyone on board, to get everyone uh, briefed. Finding people is really an issue in our industry. So um, having a big team is great. Um, people who bring diverse views to the table, it's super solving problems together, super. But again, with these type of problems, huge teams means huge communication overhead, which you usually cannot afford. Um, Sorry to, bit, to put this this bluntly, but um, design at this stage is anything but democratic. You should, sh you should have figured out your discussions, um, your opinions, your just grinding your teeth together in the, con uh, in the uh, conception phase when you're coming up with your concept. You shouldn't be doing that in production. Um, I guess everyone has seen what happens when you run in production and still haven't everything figured out. It results in nasty discussions. It results in delays. Um, at this point, you gotta, pre, uh, you gotta be pragmatic. Um, advertising, animation for advertising can be pretty military. It must be efficient, it must be, you must, you must be efficient with that. And you cannot uh, um, allow yourself to verge into big discussions about the whole topic. I'm not saying do not ask for help, I'm just saying at this point you better have your shit figured out. Um, and the killer is um, trying to, sp to skimp on hard and software. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have the most efficient team and not give them the proper tools, they won't be able to pull off anything. And I've seen this happen so much, especially when you're working with advertising agencies. They have a hard time grasping that modern computer animation is not done on a single iMac. Um, it's just what I've witnessed over and over and over. So with that behind us, let's have a look at a few things that I've witnessed that work pretty well in that area, producing advertising <coughs> animation, photoreal animation. It's small teams. And with a small team, I usually am speaking of a <coughs> producer, um, of a director, and two to four artists. And if you have some super special needs, like 
some um, super elaborate sculpting, some really detailed character animation, hiring a freelancer who's specialized, who's focused on that. Apart from that, this like four to six man team can pull off amazing stuff in very few time, very little time. Then we touched on this, brief and clear communication. I'm not a huge fan of big meetings. It's just necessary for everyone to know what has to be done until when. The nightmare situation that I ran into was a uh, producer informing me uh, Friday afternoon that instead of what we assumed that the stuff had to be done next Thursday, it had actually be done um, next Monday. So it meant, of course, spending the weekend in. And you want to avoid this. So just be clear what until when. With that being said, um, when it comes to roles, I think the roles in motion design advertising are slightly shifting because we've seen lots of generalists um, traditionally just coming from an After Effects background and adding a bit of uh, 3D knowledge to their chops and then just de uh, developing from that, evolving from there. Um, and nowadays with the types of projects we get asked to do, which is more photoreal, more specialized, more effects work, um, the generalist, <coughs> in my opinion, has to de develop into a general specialist. That means a guy who's able to pull off decent animation and maybe a bit of basic modeling and be able to render out, maybe do a bit of shading, a bit of basic lighting and just get stuff done. However, um, this person should also have one area where he was really focused on, such as sculpting, such as character animation, or such as effects work, so that if one guy is calling in sick or something happens, some guys can take over, but there is this one special area which you can go to this guy to just have your stuff on a certain level. So a general specialist is what I see this industry currently evolving into, and it might be becoming more of a specialist industry um, in, the co in the following years, but we'll see about that. Um, finally, what really works well is a homogenous infrastructure. Um, we've seen that with heterogeneous infrastructures where you have several DCC apps that interconnect. Um, I don't know who of you has the experience of bringing over anything uh, via Alembic to another tool. Um, you will run into trouble. Um, also, my most beloved software um, after Houdini has huge issues when it comes to data exchange with Alembic. It's just, it adds um, enormous amounts of work to you. So the most amazing thing I ever saw was a Houdini-only pipeline. From the first frame to the last rendering, it was Houdini-only. It was so streamlined because you don't have to exchange data. And everyone is able to run and work in the same software. And this not only extends to software, <coughs> but also to mm -hmm. hardware. So if you're running and working on a similar hardware, you can just swap out computers if something breaks. And bummer, hardware breaks still in 2019. So homogenous infrastructure is a big help. Speaking of all that and how Houdini is so great in that context, why hasn't Houdini been huge in MoCraft so far? Um, in my opinion, that comes a bit down to those generalist things. Because traditionally um, in motion design, you had people with an arts background typically. Designers, guys who came from an advertising background, who came from an uh, arts background, and they were drawn to tools that made it easy for them to create. Tools that didn't require them to have um, any in-depth background knowledge about math, about geometry, about CG in general. So um, Houdini, on the other hand, when you look at Houdini's roots, is uh, VFX heavy and VFX heavy studios. So Houdini could be built with technologists in mind. And when you have a software that's built for technologists, for guys who come from computer science, from scripting. Nerds. And yeah, nerds. Nerds. OK. <laughs> I have <laughs> we, were, we were kind of unaware that this would be recorded, and we were trying to exchange our foul languages on the run. We have very foul language in here in our notes. So, um, so Udini was built with technologists in mind, with nerds in mind, and that's an issue when you have um, artists working with it for the first time, guys who've maybe never been scripting, who never even uh, typed in a formula, who are um, already a bit scared as soon as the first plus or multiplication symbol pops up. And of course what they do, or what I typically do then, is I head over to the documentation. But the documentation, shockingly, is also rooted in this coding paradigm. So you're reading what sometimes reads more like a reference manual than an, actual, and then an actual help file that's geared toward an artistic user. And finally, um, there is lots of legacy workflow. Especially we, we, we are uh, looking into that exact same problem when we're looking at MOPS tutorials or when I look at older Antagma tutorials. There are lots of techniques and ways of operating with Houdini that change really quickly. So you often, when you're Googling for some tutorials, you <coughs> run into some legacy tutorial that is already outdated a year or two. And you'd have no chance of determining, is this outdated, is this still relevant? And finally, Houdini is a really an open system. Um, I like to compare it more to an IDE, a development environment, than a classic DCC app. And that, of course, can be confusing. A text editor won't help you write your perfect novel. Um, it's just a text editor. It's just a tool for building stuff. 
All of this usually results in not so quick but very dirty setups. Even with seasoned artists, it gets messy quickly, um, at least when you're starting out. So the question of why mobs, um, answering it with a user-centric answer is making Houdini more accessible to non-tech-minded artists, making standard bread and butter workflow in this industry a bit simpler, a bit easier to get started, and a bit more self-explanatory, hopefully. Also, we could answer the question of why mobs on a more technical viewpoint, from a more technical viewpoint. And when you're dealing with pack primitives, which is a quick way of copying lots of stuff into your scene, and you want to transfer them, you sooner or later end up with this. This is a function call to a very neat function called set prim intrinsic, which allows you to transfer intrinsics, but you have to know your matrices, which look like that. And matrix math, also, if you're used to it, can be a bit it's awkward. It's still confusing. <laughs> it is still confusing also, uh, also to us. Um, however, most of these operations that you're doing with this mouse are highly repeatable. So they lend themselves to really packaging them up in assets, so in <coughs> digital assets that you can store and drop them down. Which brings us to how you actually build those and how you actually use those. OK, so this is my part. <laughs> uh, yeah, I assume <laughs> so, isn't it? Uh, yep. OK. Uh, so first, a case study. Just going over very briefly the standard Houdini instancing workflow. This is how you copy stuff in Houdini. Some of you might already be pretty familiar with this. Step one is you make some points and you give them some attributes. Attributes in Houdini can be things like the scale, the, you can either provide a normal and an up vector, or you can provide an orientation as a quaternion, but you, you basically say what these points transform matrices are. And then step two, you run that through a copy shop, and now you have this wonderful geometry copy doll of these points. Uh, it's a really powerful system, and it works incredibly well and quickly. And then step three, hope you don't need any more than that. Because <laughs> this system can, uh, when you start to scale it up, it can get a little confusing. Uh, so let's say you want local rotations. You want all of these things to spin along their local <laughs> axis. Well, there's your math, and you would have to program this in directly because packed primitives, when you generate them this way, they don't really have a concept of a normal or of, of a local orientation matrix. They just don't know. It's in there, but there's no easy way to access it without resorting to vex. Uh, and let's say you want a bunch of different objects randomly copied. This is one of the most common questions you're ever going to run into, and the answer is to make that node network uh, and that's for three variations. If you have, say, a dozen, that graph is going to get significantly wider. Uh, and it takes a serious amount of setup to do this if you're going to do it by hand. And so I want to contrast this with our approach, uh, which is hopefully something that people would find a little bit easier. <laughs> so step one is to copy as many objects as you like in that one node. So that's our MOPS instancer, which is under the hood, a copy shop using all these same things that you would normally use in Houdini but we package it up in a way so that you can just provide a few nodes, uh, you can provide individual probabilities, and it copies everything in place exactly the way you ask it to. Step two is transform things in local or world space, whichever you like. Uh, you can either use attributes the way that you normally would, or you can just provide your typical Euler rotations like you would with a normal transform sop. And step three is that's it. It's, it's the, the goal is to make something that's intuitive, like moving objects around and rotating them to actually be intuitive. It feels intuitive, but the underlying math is honestly kind of complicated. So our goal is to ease this for you a little bit. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the guts of how MOPS is doing this under the hood. Um, we have a sort of API uh, that drives most of the nodes that we've written in MOPS. We built it to be a framework. So there are two main nodes that do most of the heavy lifting in MOPS, and one of them is called extract attributes, and the other is called apply. Extract attributes converts these packed intrinsic attributes, these transform matrices that live inside packed primitives, into template point attributes that you use with a copy sop. So this big heavy transform matrix that's <coughs> hidden in this you know, so-called intrinsic attribute becomes n, up, scale, p scale, all the things that people are familiar with if they've used the copy sop at all. Uh, and these attributes are the exact same ones used by the copy shop. So if you pull the intrinsics out of this, you can use those in another copy shop down the chain. The, it, the, the goal is to make packed primitive intrinsic attributes and template point attributes, these two different ways of thinking about instancing, basically the same. Apply attributes, on the other hand, is sort of going in the opposite direction. So we blend the transforms from input B into input A based on a, what we call a falloff attribute, which is just a single scalar attribute, a floating number from 0 to 1, 
uh, that just determines how much of something you want to blend in. So it's a very conceptually simple way of thinking about applying some kind of transformation to a set of objects. And so here you have these little rubber toys that are blending into the transforms that used to be those pig heads from the previous example. Uh, and that's just me animating that fall off value from zero to one. And our system supports a bunch of little tricks under the hood. We support, uh, you know, in addition to the fall off attribute, we have a, uh, uh, a pre-transform that we call mops orient. That's just another separate attribute that you can generate that's a quaternion that allows you to specify rotation axes after the fact without actually having to unpack these things or change anything else under the hood. So it, it's a very quick way of being able to spin these things around however you like. Uh, and so extract, apply, transform, all of these things are basically uh, the core API nodes that we then use inside of our other nodes to build additional tools. So a big part of how we want the MOP system to work is for users, especially more technically advanced users, to start taking these core API nodes and building their own operators with them. Because all of our operations, or at least most of, most of them, are built using these same tools. So then the rest of it, these are the sort of the loose classification of nodes. We divide it into four broad categories. Uh, category four, I already went through, that's sort of the API nodes, the tool nodes. And then these are the more uh, higher level categories. Generators are just shortcuts for making stuff. So the instancer is one kind of generator, but then we have a few other examples here. The one on the left is explode, the subdivider is up in the top right, and then at the bottom is sweep spline. And these are all meant to just solve problems in Houdini of content of generating geometry that just tend to be kind of annoying to do manually. Yeah, really proud of the sweep spline. <laughs> yeah, the sweep spline in particular, if you want to actually do that, you can use a poly wire or you can use a sweep sop and there's a few other little options like that. But getting all the details right can be really tricky. If you want it to twist, you have to actually be familiar enough with the math to make the, the curve matrix twist along its line when you, when you uh, copy the cross section to the backbone. If you want proper UVs especially, this can be really difficult. I still can't remember the order of operations, which uh, maybe it's the backbone has to have point UVs and then the cross section has to have vertex UVs. It's, it, when it works, it works very well, but it's very complicated to set up and I have to re reference my own notes yeah. every single time I want to do this effect. And that's a lot of wasted time. Um, Falloffs are our interface for creating this simple scalar attribute. So on the right there, you can just see it's this, we visualize it as a heat map in most of our examples. Um, but it's just a way of deciding how much of an effect you want to apply. Uh, it's a single zero to one scalar value, that's it. Um, and these values are generated by simple sign distance functions, uh, by textures, by other objects, by existing volumes. There's a lot of different ways that we give you to sort of uh, animate and create these falloff values so that you don't have to type in any code to make it work. Yeah, and I'm going to let Moritz talk about how we stole all of these functions from Inigo Quilas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Inigo Quilas, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a bright guy and he's amazing. He, he's also go, the guy who invented and wrote Shader Toy. So SDFs is just, think about it as a function, takes an XYZ coordinate and returns a single value. Single value between usually minus something to plus value. Uh, and what you do is, um, in our case, you evaluate it and to drive just the strength of the effect. But what you can also do and where you might know it from is you can use it for rendering. So actually what this guy likes to do, and if you have lots of time, you can actually pull this off. This whole render here is one implemented in Shader Toy, so that's his web-based platform for you to write shaders in. On the other hand, this is all SDFs, so this is individual functions where the guy models just the whole world that he's displaying there. And what you do when rendering with an SDF is just, you try to find where your function crosses a zero, so where it goes from negative to positive, and that's where your surface area uh, um, lives in space. Really handy, for example, to render highly procedural, highly detailed volumes. Um, or if you're into building those kinds of formulas, you can also build like real world scenes. And I find this really incredible what he can pull off his. Um, and of course, it also starts appearing in render engines. Mantra, of course, can do it with the volume procedural. Interestingly enough, Otoy um, also um, decided to implement it in Octane. Um, of course, they couldn't call it sign distance function or distance estimator. They called it a Vectron instead. Brilliant marketing. <laughs> And of course, they also decided to ship a standard Mandelbaum formula with two parameters set up wrongly. So <laughs> when you Google Vectron, you can all see those um, erroneous Mandelbaum renders here from uh, Octane. But nevertheless, 
you can see that they get lots of detail without adding geometry and evaluating pretty quickly when you're rendering. So they are handy not only if you want to just do a single value in MOPS, but also when you want to build highly intricate geometry that you can somehow model with a formula. OK, so modifiers are the third class of nodes that we make. And these are the ones that are doing most of the heavy lifting. These are the ones that are actually changing transform matrices. And the, the goal of modifiers overall is to just make things that are conceptually simple. Again, I want to rotate stuff. I want to move stuff uh, uh, forward. You know, uh, These things can become mathematically difficult really quickly, and we just want to make them as easy as possible. So here's a simple example. I want to move something forward by five units. Well, what's forward? That's sort of the first question is you have to actually now think, OK, I need to break. I need to first, if this thing has a pre-transform, I'm going to multiply the inverse of that by the existing transform intrinsic. And then I'm going to multiply four p positive z, 0, 0, 1, by this transform and then add to the, add to p, that vector, scaled by MOPS falloff. So this is not really that complicated. It's wordy. Um, but this is just already something that you have to start thinking about. This is to move something forward a few units. Now, a more complicated example, I want to rotate 90 degrees along each object's local x-axis. OK, so first I have to multiply the multiply the pre-transform intrinsic. Uh, then I need to rotate that matrix in the correct rotation order, because we're dealing with Euler rotations, because that's how most people want to interface with these things. So for each axis in the correct rotate order. Uh, and then I need to convert that matrix to a quaternion, and then spherically linear interpolate, or slurp, that result with the existing quaternion. Uh, in order to blend it according to the MOPS falloff value and then convert that back to a matrix and then apply that as a primitive intrinsic. So it's a bit of a mouthful uh, and not something I ever want to have to think about more than once. And now for an example, I want to slide a bunch of objects along a curve in a helical shape, but I want them to twist along the way and then I want the ones at the end of the curve to loop back to the start when they pass it. And uh, yeah, vomit while crying is the best way I can describe the creation or, or of the MOPS move along stuff. spline operator. <laughs> Uh, and it's just, uh, uh, it is something that a good technical writer can do and should be able to do, but it's going to take a little bit of time to figure out. And if you have dailies tomorrow, uh, I don't know why you would want to do that. There, uh, you, this, these are the kinds of operations that should be distilled down into sim conceptually simple operations. Anybody should be able to move and transform things in Houdini, and they should be able to do it easily. Uh, and that's our goal. So back to Moritz. Uh, yeah, talk a bit about um, who is our target audience and the communication interaction with users. So if any hands up, who runs a forum, who runs a Discord, who owns a website? Ah, OK. OK. <laughs> yeah, a bit. So you might have seen some of this happening here. And again, this is just my, my experiences with running a website, with answering users, with, with user interaction. So people tend to project onto what you publish. Be it a tool, be it a tutorial, people tend to project on it. Um, their wishes, what they wish this piece to do, or th what they w wish this certain content to be, even though you never mention any of this ever happening. So people fantasize about this. So a few misconceptions that we got about MOPS is it's just like MoGraph slash it's just like MASH, which superficially it might look like that. It just isn't. It's still an open toolkit. It's still something you can heavily dive into. You can dissect. You can build it into whatever you like. It's it's open source, just take it, take it apart, rebuild it, do with it, whatever you like. It's a full toolkit. Um, also, MOPS is not a shortcut to learning Houdini. Although we set out to make certain operations easier inside of Houdini, it'll definitely not teach you the basics of Houdini. You have to have a, at least a basic understanding of what's going on under the hood of the logic of the software. It's not going to teach you Houdini from the beginning and through its interface or something. Um, it also is not a closed ecosystem. And I mean, you had your share of experiences with that. This has been a big frustration of mine, is that when people see that it's a separate, you know, they'll call it a plugin or a separate class of nodes, Houdini is all native VEX, it's pretty much nothing else. A little bit of Python to tie some ends together, yeah. but it's all native Houdini. And these packed primitives, these template attributes are all Houdini standards. So you can mix and match our nodes with native Houdini nodes almost 100% of the time. Uh, at, at whenever you like. We don't, we're trying our hardest to keep this be as native Houdini as we possibly can so that it doesn't interrupt people's work. Which leads to this. I mean, we've been after it. And it, yes, it works on Apprentice, it works on Indie, and it even works on Mac and Linux. So I don't know why people assume this, but it just works on any workstation in any environment where you have a running Houdini. Um, 
which is finally getting me to the point of coping with communications because once you're running a website, once you're running a forum, once you're running anything with a back channel, you get these types of questions. Is it for free? Yes. <laughs> Talk, please. <laughs> Where can I download it? So, and you're just like, dude, I put this on the website. It's, it literally says everything in the first line. Every single one of these questions. <laughs> um, so these, might, these questions might hint to two things. Either you have a bad web design, which we might have, so we can fix that. And the second thing, and I learned that only very recently, and, and that's my interpretation of it. And again, it might not be right. But these kind of questions are just a nice way or an awkward way for people to communicate with you. Um, so the way I take these questions nowadays is yes, they want an answer on that, and I'll give them on it, uh, and I'll give them an answer. But also, it's a way for users to say, hey, um, I'm interested in your toolkit. Hey, I'm trying to use your toolkit. Hey, I'm starting to use your toolkit. It's just... They're just lonely. It's just... <laughs> 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 this is recorded. <laughs> this is recorded. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, Henry talks a bit about making your own toolkit. So, <laughs> so these are uh, things we learned from repeated, repeated mistakes along the way while we were <laughs> building mops. Uh, first off is namespaces, and this is something that Houdini does go over in the documentation, but when you're building a toolkit, it's important to make sure that your toolkit is still classified somehow. It's, it's in its own little box, its own safe little package, and the way to do that is with namespaces. So our namespace in all of our node is obviously mops, but it's important when you do this to make sure that your toolkit can't have name clashes with other toolkits, because there are a lot of custom stuff out there, and if you name something box, uh, chances are it's going to clash with something else. Uh, Versioning is another big part, and this also goes into the operator names. It is possible in Houdini and pro should be necessary to define a version because you can have multiple versions of your tool live within a single HDA. And the other advantage of this is that uh, if you enable the asset, uh, the operator type bar or whatever it's called, you can actually change the version just using a drop down menu in the middle of your stream. So not only is that easier for just uh, sort of diffing two versions of your HDA, making sure that you fix the things that you thought you would fix, but it also makes, makes room for backwards compatibility. So we release patches at a pretty frantic pace, and we don't want to break people's existing setups if they're in the middle of production. So using version control like this make, uh, makes sure that other people's old HIP files won't break when they reopen them months later, or immediately if they try to update. Uh, speaking of version control, get uh, is something that we both had to learn on the fly while we were developing this. And uh, I, I, till this day, didn't learn. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's its own language. Git is the reigning champion of version control software. It's just really confusing for newcomers. It really is its own language. And if you're not familiar with the command line, if you're not a, tech, a technical artist who spends all day in, you know, in Linux or whatever, uh, it takes a little getting used to, but it's honestly insane to not develop software with Git. You need it. If you're going to do any kind of development like this, you absolutely need it. And then finally, the social media component of building a toolkit and trying to get it out there. Uh, what we realized really quickly is that we needed social media in multiple places to get any kind of buzz going at all. And also, as it turns out, uh, people don't read. <laughs> if you want anything to get across to anyone on social media, it has to be accompanied by an image, preferably a GIF or at least something very brightly colored. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we found that we got so many more responses from people, uh, especially positive responses, if we just included something bright and colorful <laughs> along with every post. Yeah. It's kind of depressing in some ways, but that's just how it is on social media and you really need to do it if you're going to get any attention. With that, having your attention, thanks so much. If you want to try out the stuff, motionoperators.com or Googling Mops Houdini would lead you to us pretty fast, I think. And um, I think we have like five to 10 minutes on here. So um, yep. we have a short live demo prepared for being brave. Um, all the while, feel free to ask questions or throw insults at us. We're happy. <laughs> and also, please try the Capri Stun. It's terrible. Yes, please do so. And uh, yeah, you've, you've been warned. It tastes every, every wrong taste you can imagine. It's sweet, it's sour, it's tart, it's astringent and yeasty. It's, <laughs> it's got a yes, nice rotten question. eggs quality to it. The question is, do you mean the, the double colon, the double colon? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah the, it's a double colon for the namespace up front, and then the version is a single colon and a number afterwards. The version number, does it, can it be any string? I don't actually know, but by convention, at least if it's going to match the rest of SOP tools, it should be a number. Oh, yeah, of course.
He was asking about namespaces and then whether the version control number can be any string or if it, I, I would recommend keeping it to a major and minor version the, the way that the internal tools work. Um, so I have a quick little demonstration of two different applications of MOPS. One of them geared towards motion design, which is our main audience, and then the other is more of a technical use case for MOPS showing what you can do with the API under the hood. So this is a really simple little spinner animation. It's nothing wild, but if you were doing this in vanilla Houdini, it would probably take a little while to figure out exactly how to do rotations. I like his face, by the way. Yeah. That first sip, that's... Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, fir the first sip tells a lot about it <laughs> and about the personality and how akin to suffering he is. <laughs> so going through this network really quick, we start with an instancer, which is just putting this cube out there a bunch of times. The arrangement doesn't matter in this case because we're going to patch it up later, but this is just getting the cubes out there. MOPS kind of works backwards from a normal copy stop workflow where you define all of your point attributes up front and then copy afterwards. In this case, you copy everything first and then set the intrinsics, which sometimes can be faster. It, it sort of depends on the number of instances that you have. Uh, so move along spline here basically attaches all of these objects to the spline. And there are, op there are options in here to uh, twist it and have them wrap from start to finish as they go along. So you can see that they're kind of just moving along and rotating as they go. So the next step is applying a fall off. So this is the controller for it. I'm going to turn on visualization on this fall off so you can see the heat map. But all this is doing is just sort of dipping across and then up again. Uh, and with that fall off value, I apply a transform, and so this is just in a single axis, but because it's moving along its local axis, you can get this interesting twisting behavior that you would otherwise have to get from uh, you know, using sine cosine functions, something like that. You would have to actually set it up that way yourself. Uh, so then I remap that fall off, and I'll again, I'll visualize this one, so all I'm doing is inverting it, and then apply a scaling effect. That's it. Uh, and so this kind of thing would probably take a little bit of time in VEX to figure out or a little bit of time with expressions to actually get this up and running. Uh, but with MOPS, it just becomes a little bit more intuitive and it's something that you can just slap together and then spend more time kind of playing with it instead of thinking about the math. So the next example is more, a little bit more technical. And this is an example of, doing, of adjusting a rigid body simulation post-sim in a somewhat more intuitive way. So I'm using MOPS in this case twice. This is a, a simple shatter sim where it just falls apart starting from one place at the end of the tentacles. The order of the breakage is defined in MOPS using our spread fall off, which is really just a, a procedural way of, of uh, generating growth effects. So you can see this kind of heat map. It spreads out from a single point, and this is done without any solvers at all. So it's pretty quick to evaluate. Um, so with this, I'm, if you, s you can see at the end here, there are a lot of pieces that just sort of, and this is a common problem in rigid body simulations, pieces kind of dancing around. They're not losing, they're not, there's not enough friction. They kind of jitter and roll around all over the place. And a lot of the time in simulations, you spend you know, maybe 50% of your time post-simulation fixing these problems. So in this example, I'm just isolating one of these to fix in particular. Uh, I time shift it and then I run it through MOPS extract attributes, which takes its primitive intrinsic and turns it into template point attributes frozen during this period. The other thing that I'm doing is applying a plain fall off, which if I preview this here, I'm just keyframing fall off during these two frames from zero to one. And when I run this through apply, what that means is that this object, which otherwise, I'm just highlighting it in red here for you, which would otherwise be spin spinning around quite a lot, I just blend that out completely. So I'll show the original here. So here's the original. You can see the highlights sort of rolling around. And I can just blend that transform in so that it, instead of just time shifting it, it slowly reaches a rest point. It looks a little bit more natural. And this means that I don't have to deal with any of the intrinsics. I don't have to actually sit there and keyframe anything other than a single attribute to just get this thing to stop moving. And then as a, just a final example at the end, here I can do that same kind of fall off blend. Sorry, just to literally animate the entire simulation on and off at the end. So I can take this entire thing and just push everything back to the original. So it, there's, you know, this isn't the most practical example in the world of what you could be doing with it, but the, I guess the goal of this part of the demonstration is to show that this isn't just for motion graphics. Like this is a tool for interfacing with instances, pack primitives, transforms, whatever you want to call them, and building your own tools to support whatever your own workflow is. 
Uh, and that's all I got. If there's any more questions. I'd be happy to. Otherwise, try our booze and we'll hang around. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank Cheers. <laughs>we do have tutorials although we ran to the issue that I mentioned uh, some of them are the done quite a while ago and lots of changes we implemented we've been devel developing pretty quickly so the tutorial videos are enough to get you started conceptually but the interfaces aren't going to match anymore yeah. what I would recommend checking first is the mops wiki which is yeah. linked from the github and there's also if you install mops the mops shelf has a button that will take you directly there Thank you.